an eye from another world. A smell detector, investigating the path ahead. We don't often see a snail that way. And that's because we've only recently had the tiny lenses and electronic cameras that we need to explore this miniature world. But when we meet its inhabitants face to face, we suddenly realize that their behavior can be just as meaningful to us as the behavior of many animals more our own size. Look at this, for example. It's an earwig, yes. But it's also a female and a mother. And like so many mothers, she's guarding her young. These two ants are not quite sure whether they like one another. Stroking antennae is the equivalent of a cautious chat over the garden fence. When big animals go courting, they show off, and so do damselflies. Courtship signals for the male wolf spider are rather more frantic, because if his female doesn't understand why he's approaching her, she'll eat him. This ant is a farmer, and these aphids, the cows, which it milks for a drink of honeydew every day. Other ants are eternally on the march. Powerfully armed soldiers guard the flanks of their column as they travel, protecting the workers who are carrying their helpless young. When it comes to craftsmanship, few can beat this wasp using mud to construct an elegant jar in which to store her eggs. Mud is also used by termites. They build tower blocks that in proportion to their size are taller than New York skyscrapers. These two worlds, ours and theirs, influence one another to an extraordinary degree. If we end the rest of the backbone animals were to disappear overnight, the rest of the world would get on pretty well. But if they were to disappear, the land's ecosystems would collapse. For the fact is, they were the pioneers, the first animals of any kind to colonize the lands of the earth. To tell their story, we must go back to a time when the world was a very different place. Some 400 million years ago, the lands of planet Earth were totally without life. They were bare, naked rock, roasted by sun during the day, freezing cold at night, and swept by terrible storms. But in the waters of the world, conditions were much more stable. Life had begun there some 2,000 million years earlier still. For a long time, it remained microscopic, but eventually larger animals appeared. Jellyfish and corals, starfish and snails, and animals with segmented bodies. All needed food. Many would have eaten unguarded eggs, given the chance. And then, around 400 million years ago, some enterprising creatures found it safer to lay their eggs out of the sea, up on a beach. They still do. Every spring, on a few special nights along the Atlantic coast of North America, thousands of horseshoe crabs emerge from the sea. Here, in the wet sand, they spawn. 
They may only stay for a few minutes or hours, but animals like these may well have been the first of any kind to leave the sea and venture onto land. Although these creatures spend virtually all their lives at sea, they can survive surprisingly well on land. It's almost as if they were pre-adapted. They have shells, external skeletons, and that means that their legs are rigid and jointed. And at the back, they have a series of plates called book lungs, which extract oxygen from seawater but can also do the same thing if they're kept reasonably moist from the air. So, creatures like this can in fact spend about a week on land. And it only requires minimal modifications to enable them to live up there permanently. It was difficult to abandon the sea altogether until the land became green. But eventually, it did. Simple plants, algae and then mosses and liverworts, began to advance over the mud and rock to clothe the earth. And into these first green tackles came animals looking for food. Some had armor, for that in the sea had protected them from their enemies. Now it would help them conserve moisture. They were the ancestors of today's millipedes. Small holes had developed along the underside of their bodies that led to internal tubes with which they could absorb oxygen from the air. Their rigid jointed legs, however, were largely unchanged and worked very well on land, even without the support of water. Battering ram heads enabled them to bulldoze their way through the vegetation to collect the rotting plants on which they fed. They grew big, increasing the number of segments in their bodies. Some had over 300, each with two pairs of legs. Some that didn't curl up reinforced their armor with plates along their backs. Crustaceans like shrimps came too. They were the ancestors of wood lice. So today, there is a huge and varied population of animals living on the land with bodies that are little different from those of their ancestors who lived in the sea so long ago. So the foundations were laid for the ecosystems that now flourish on Earth and on which we ourselves depend. It has to be said, however, that sometimes some of us regard a few of these pioneers more as our enemies than our friends. Many of the mollusks in the sea develop shells to protect themselves from predators. But on land, those shells serve just as well to keep the occupant nice and moist. So, without any major change to their anatomy, 
mollusks were able to creep up out of the water and graze in the forests of algae and mosses that were then spreading over the land. And given the right conditions, they still do. With rain and the coming of night, a secret army comes out of hiding. These are the conditions they like best. Dark, and best of all, wet. Gliding along a carpet of slime works just as well on land as it does underwater. And a rasping tongue scrapes algae off rocks wherever they are. In times of drought, snails may be unable to move around for months on end. So when conditions are right, they eagerly set off to find food. Their upper pair of tentacles carry those eyes with which they look around. The lower ones smell what's beneath. They breathe by means of a small pouch on the right-hand side of their body, just within the shell, which, because it's permanently moist, is able to absorb oxygen. This is what they're seeking, a succulent green leaf. No time to be lost. Dawn will bring a change in conditions. So they have to return to their shelters and clamp down their shells once more so that they retain their moisture. 